Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rough Sketch to Final Draft. I am your host, Coach Adam, and we are continuing on our journey of the topic of from trauma to transformation. And this has been an incredible journey throughout these episodes and covering the topic that really is bringing transformation to individuals that may have not been aware of where they might need to go in life. I've been visited by incredible speakers. And this topical journey most likely will continue on in more episodes to come in the future. Though today I am visited by our amazing esteemed guest, Coach Cindy. I'm going to allow her to introduce herself and give her credentials and backgrounds for the benefit of the audience. So welcome, Cindy. Thank you so much for being with us. And I'm so grateful, as well as the audience is. So please tell us more about yourself and a little bit about uh, your background. Thank you so much for having me, Adam. This is absolutely my pleasure. And I'm honored that you would consider me in this very, very important list of women you've had so far. Um, I feel so honored to be among them. Um, well, my name is Cindy. I am 41 years old. I reside in Denmark. And I have a son, 12 years old. I am married on the sixth year. Now, I also have a bonus daughter that's 17. So my mother skills is being tested sometimes um i am a triple certified coach i mm. do transformational coaching i do enneagram coaching for those of you who know what the enneagram is and i'm also an accountability coach so connected all these things it makes me kind of a lethal weapon as a coach i can be super hard i can be a drill sergeant but at the same time I can be soft as butter and I can make you take it to the next level, which is why my business is named Next Level Awareness. So yeah, and I am here because Adam focuses on some things that truly align with my soul and my passion for helping women who's been through some kind of trauma in their life. It doesn't have to be surviving war or something super dramatic of that but it could be an abusive partner or verbal abuse in the home or something like that it could be a job loss or loss of a child something that changed their life and now they want to find their footing and reinvent themselves mm -hmm. so that's what my main focus is trying to help these women find their balance again and i have my little society that i call the phoenix flock where we focus on rising from the ashes and supporting each other. And I try to create a safe space where they can bring whatever they feel like for that week. And we sit down and we talk about it online and just create a space for them to come and air whatever is on their mind. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. And I would definitely say that you have been succeeding at creating safe spaces for individuals to heal <laughs> ever since I first fell onto your wonderful content via Instagram and of course for the audience her links and everything else like that for her website and where to find her will be down below after this episode is posted um, truly resonated with me in a, in a genuine sense like the actual work that you do put forth and the energy that you put forth into the work that you do is incredible you can feel your presence in what you do in the truest sense it's one of those things where life is not scripted Right. I mean, there there are okay. careers out there as actors or actresses and nothing against that. I'm using this as an analogy for those who are also newscasters. They're reading a script. It's on the teleprompter. If you had two people read the exact same script, it really will matter on whether or not they're bringing to life those words that are being spoken that someone else wrote. The way in which you yeah. pour forth who you are into that script really is the defining difference of a fantastic performance of an actor or actress or whether or not. It was, you know, in a different category. The way in which you show up for people, Cindy, is absolutely the reason why I was drawn towards you and for this amazing audience for whatever time that you ever find us now or in the future, because once it's on the internet, it's there to stay. Um, yes, it is. You're welcome here. Uh, we love you. We're going to create a space for you today for some healing as we go through this beautiful topic together. And Cindy's going to walk us through this beautiful journey of, of a, a myriad of different things that she has as, as advice topical solutions, yeah. tools, things. So as we jump into that, 
together. Um, let's dive into the idea, kind of start off right from the, the beginning. Where is it that you would say in your coaching experience, in the, the triple threat that you offer um, with this one, two, three punch to be able to be there, where has the transformational growth been able to reveal itself in the most impactful way? We're going to kind of go from transformation back to trauma, trauma back to transformation. So let's start with the transformational portion. Where is that kind of taking place um, for you? I think for me, the fact that I, three or four years ago, I lost almost 50 pounds. Mm. I had gained so much weight due to medication. Oh. which I found out later wasn't supposed to be taken in the first place, but we'll get back to that later. Okay. Um, so I had been on what a lot of people are on, antidepressants sometime along their life. Um, I had been put on lithium as well because they thought that was the right one for me. Um, and I always said, I'm not going to be doing all this forever. I want to figure out a way to get around the medication. I want to do is the natural way. And a year after um, getting married, I sat down and I looked at my photos from that day. And I could just see that woman on those pages. She yeah. was not me. I couldn't recognize her. She was, she was round in the face and she was just not me. And all I saw was just sadness and a heartbroken feeling just crept in. And I thought, this cannot be me and this cannot be my future. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I was going to do something about it. And I knew that this coaching thing, I was going to help other women do the same thing. Because if I could do it, then others could do it as well. And I wanted to use my journey from my huge life as I saw it, because I had gained more than a fifth of my natural weight. I'm usually the skinny little girl. So this was a major deal for me. Um, and I did it. I hired a personal coach online. I did everything at the home with my own body weight and just small hand weights and stuff like that. And I, of course I ate better than I've ever eaten, but it was not fanatic. It was yeah. not extreme. It was not anything else. I didn't do a lot of supplements. Um, I tried, of course, Vincent and his whole universe of v -thread. Um, I found my way to American things as well. No. Um, but the fact that I saw those pictures, I took every Sunday standing in front of that mirror and I could see the difference. I couldn't see it every day when I looked at it and I put on my clothes, but I could mm. see it every Sunday when I yeah. saw those pictures change and I knew ah, I'm onto something here. I need to tell my story because this is not just me. This is a super simple process I did. And I need to make sure that other people know how easy this is to do. Um, and then I found my coaching certifications. And I actually did. My 2021 was a super busy year for me. I did. I, I finished my education as a project manager at Google Incorporated. As well as did two out of three coaching session a uh, coaching certifications on top of it and started my own business and yeah. being a mom every other week for a 12 year old and a 17 year old and trying to be a mom and a daughter and a sister and a girlfriend and everything else in between um so i was just like pp long stocking for those of you who know that one i was go 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 and over the edge and just do this and do that and let's try this and yeah. at some point i just whoa you need to put all these ideas into paper. You need to make some kind of structure. You need to use it. Tools. You need to make coaching tools <laughs> out of these things you've done. So yeah. I guess my weight loss was definitely the prime motor in all this. That yeah. was to fuel. That was the moment of no more and yeah. ever again. Seeing those pictures. Back. I've seen some of them. Yeah, the Instagram exactly. ones are very, very motivating. If anyone who's listening right now. Oh, that's right. Them. There are a lot of them on Instagram. That's yeah. right. This woman is absolutely yeah. incredible. She is, she is the walking proof of you can change your life. So, it, Adam, it was horrible. I looked as though I was five months pregnant. Hmm. 
and I don't even have uterus, so that's not possible. So I knew something was wrong,、yeah. um, and I was actually afraid that I might have cancer, that、yeah. something was inside me, and I was sick, and that was because I had gained weight. And it turned out that it was all just bad habits. It was、yeah. all just sleeping poorly, getting the wrong medication, not working out, and just not taking care of myself. I was just Taking care of everybody else around me, and my own mind was playing tricks on me,、yeah. and keep telling me you don't have time to do this, you don't have time to do that, and you have to do this instead, and you can't just blah blah. All these stupid excuses we tell ourselves not to go after our goals.、Yeah. Or in Denmark we have something called Yendelon that says you can't be better than anyone else.、Mm. Don't stick out. You have to be like the rest of us and stuff like that. And for me. I was really. I don't fit in here.、Yeah. Should I move? Should I leave the country? Should I go somewhere else? Because there's not room for me here.、Right. But I stayed, and I found my way anyway. And every American coach I have in my phone book keeps telling me that I shouldn't change a stupid thing. I should just be me and do how I do, because what you see here is what you get. This is me. This is not Cindy on camera with Adam. This is Cindy the way Cindy is, the way Cindy coaches. This is the same energy I bring to my coaching sessions, the same energy I bring in as a mom, or as a business owner. When I go into meetings, it's the same open-minded, candid way of being. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'll attest to that. Ever since we first connected, this is who you've been the entire time. <laughs> Oh, absolutely, audience. She's amazing.、Yeah. She is transparent through and through, and absolutely the genuine article. I think it's one of the things that is most compelling and authentic about anyone's journey in general. Is it also when it's one hundred percent vulnerable and authentically unique、yeah. to theirs? There's so many individuals that have done so many things in this world, and so many individuals in the modern day world that tend to. To keep it in the rough sketch to final draft kind of you know、um, editor writing style stylized words,、hmm. people are legitimately guilty of plagiarism. Right? There's a lot of individuals out there trying to live the life of someone else. They are trying to be copycats. They are trying to take someone else's manuscript and legitimately transpose、yeah. that into their chapters of their own lives. And isn't it interesting how individuals then get frustrated with their life in that chapter that they just transpose this other person's writing into? Now they're frustrated、yeah. that their life isn't going the way they want. Well, the accountability is there. Whenever you point a finger, there's always three fingers pointing back at you. The work of transposing someone else's life and wanting to live it just the way that they did is actually the frustration.、Yeah. All we have is ourselves to hold accountable of not living authentically. And how much more amazing our lives always pan out to be for each and every single one of us as individuals. We just take off the mask, put down、yeah. the lies, the BS, if I can, to put it in a nice term, and really just live、yeah. in a raw, authentic way, like you have, and you've done it, and that's inspiring. That's one of the things that first touched my heart when I found your content. Is here's an individual who is just authentically them. They're putting it out there. And they're leading by example in a world filled with copycats. You were the genuine article, and、okay. I respect that out of you highly, Cindy. So I want everyone、okay. to, to know、it、that. It took a long a time, Adam. I do have I do have a private Instagram account as well、um, that I've had for since Instagram surfaced,、yeah. and then I started this one for the business maybe two years ago. Yeah.、Um, and of course, the content is different. There is more of my kid. There is more of everyday life on the other one. I don't post on it very. Often,、sure. I focus on my next level account,、um, and as you have seen throughout this past half a year, maybe there has been a lot of more content revolving around trauma、yep. and trauma informed coaching, because I have been gathering courage、mm. to open up about my own experiences、yep. and how vulnerable and how honest could I really be. With the audience and people viewing all this, because of course we all have our friends and family on、right. there on social media following us and liking stuff. And sometimes, are you ready for your family and your friends to see what content you put up? Yeah. Sometimes you need to go in and block certain people if you don't want them to see stuff. 
I'm yeah. not talking about bad mouthing your friends or your family, but some things can just be super personal and it is our own experience of these things. It has our own layer of filter and everything. Our feelings, our views, our way of seeing life has been put on it when mm. we tell these stories. So my experience of the same situation is not the same as if my sister were telling the same story. Right. So that took a long time for me to get, gather enough courage to say, okay, I can talk about my experiences here. I can actually open up and say, yes, I was raped when I was a teenager. But it, dis it does not define me today. I will not let that trauma be me. I have turned it around and used it to help other women who have experienced the same thing. And it doesn't have to be as a teenager. It can be, for me, it was a weird situation. When you and I were talking before we started recording, I told you that my story was not A to Z. It maybe right. started at R or S, and then we had to go back to A yeah. and move through the letters because yeah. I didn't find out about the rape until seven years ago, six or seven years ago. It was subconsciously closed off from I was 16 years old until I turned 35 wow. because my mind wasn't ready to cope with the fact. So I had been getting, I was asking for help because I had anxiety. Super stupid, simple. I couldn't take the trash out at night. And I went to seek help because I couldn't figure out why I couldn't take the trash out at night. And talking to this psychiatrist, she just said, okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Why is control so important to you? And I was like, it's always been. What are you talking about? That's just me. Right. If I control stuff, then I know what's going to happen. Super easy. Right. And then it happened. It was just, Adam, it felt like we're seeing a lot about the space station and TV these days. True. Um, because we have the Danish astronaut up there. Right. And if you imagine this kind of a hatch in that space shuttle yeah. opening up, and I sat in that chair, that hatch opened, and I just got flooded with memories and sounds and pictures and pain and fear and every emotion, everything you could imagine of a situation. If you're trying to remember, a horrible situation in your life, imagine how it would feel if everything came at you at once, in an instant. Yeah. That is what it felt like. I, had, I felt like I had just been raped in that moment when my subconscious opened up and this entire memory or experience came out. I call it the episode. That is what I have nicknamed it. Because it is only an episode. In my life, it's not the entire series or the entire movie. It's only an episode. So I sat there. This, in my book, Ridiculous Psychiatrist, you said, oh, mm, okay, we'll talk again in six weeks. Uh, whoa, excuse me? You can't just leave me hanging here. I just found out I was sexually assaulted at 16 yeah. years old. It's been hidden in my mind for 18 years. And you're just going to send me home and leave me for six weeks? That's when you no, 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 no. Cannot yeah. happen. <laughs> wow. Right. So, of course, I did what I've always done. I took matters into my own hands. I contacted the Center for Rape Victims here in my city. They couldn't help me because I had already talked to that other woman. In Denmark, you can't have help two places. You have to finish one thing first. <laughs> so I kind of had to stay with her and see what this was going to be like. And if anybody out there who's ever tried the type of treatment that's called flooding, then they'll know what I'm talking about. It means that they will take you through the horrible experience. Yeah. They will make you record it on some kind of dictaphone yeah. and they will have you replay it daily to kind of make you overwhelmed or immune to the whole situation so right. that you will feel numb at some point. I couldn't do it. It was breaking me apart. I did it for two weeks. She couldn't tell me when I was supposed to stop with this treatment. And I ended up banging my fist in the table and saying, I'm not coming back. You're breaking me apart. I was curled up in a ball in the sofa, crying under my covers. 
when my kid was upstairs and I was trying to hide it from him. He was three or four years old. I could not tell him what had happened to mom. I couldn't, and I couldn't function as a mother. My own mother stood there looking at me like, you're breaking apart, honey. This is not going to happen. So I was crumbled. I had been depressed 10 years earlier in my life. I had never been as low as I was during that treatment. I felt like nothing. I felt so violated, worse than anything I've ever tried. So I ended up saying, I'm not coming back. You are ruining me. You're breaking me up into atoms. I can't do it. So she was angry and she tried for 10 days to bring me back. And I said, it's not going to happen. I'm going to find another way. I tried EMDR. For those of you who don't know what that is, that is kind of a therapy. Hypnosis, where you have to follow certain hand movements of your therapist. And they will try to shrink this memory into a teeny tiny picture in your mind to make it feel this violent. And it worked. But it only worked as if I had been given a Band-Aid on this yeah. incident. It didn't work permanently. So I tried to cope with things on my own for a few years while taking all these lithium pills and sleeping pills and anxiety pills because I was my mind was just a mess. And that is when all this weight gain started happening on top of everything else. Yeah. And when I started losing all that weight, of course, my mind got a boost of confidence because all of a sudden I felt good in my own skin. I felt good in my own clothes. I was wearing what I wanted to wear, looking like I wanted to look. And that gave me courage enough to go to my doctor and say, you need to get me off these medications. This does not feel right. I'm ruining my organs with all this crap. And he said, okay, we can do that nice and slowly, but not right now. Let's wait. Okay. And I had actually found an American guy called Matt Atkinson. He specializes in women who's been raped. He's helped more than 4,000 women. He works out of Oklahoma. And he's written a workbook that is supposed to go hand in hand with a therapist where you go through the entire process. I have, Adam, I have thrown that book across the room. Some of these pages are so hard to get yeah. through. Right. Page 30, I think I tried that one five times because it was so hard, because it lists all the things that you keep telling yourself as a victim, that I am all this, I am all that, I am not good enough. So when I found your content, where you kept on repeating, know your worth, I knew, okay, I had to reach out and say, hi, I'm here, I'm hearing you, and this one resonates with me. Yeah. Um, so I, I managed to get through Matt's book, on my own and it was super duper hard work eventually i found a hypnotherapist and she did kind of a harry potter hermione thing on me where she took me back on a train to that day that life-changing day we yeah. talked about it and it was like teeny tiny cindy watching grown-up cindy experiencing all this but I was able to hold teeny tiny Cindy's hand hmm. and do it with the strength that I have as a grown woman. So I could connect with my inner child and say, hey, I'm here. It's okay. You're not alone anymore. We can do this together. These assholes are not going to win the battle. So she took me through it all. And mm -hmm. it, I didn't shed one tear during those sessions. I sat there. We went through it just like a storytelling. I felt everything, but it didn't hurt. I saw everything, but I wasn't scared. I was just in it, like an out-of-body experience all the way. And she just said, now, we're going to come back to now. And one last thing, what do you want to do to these guys? No one is going to judge you. No one is going to come after you. No one's going to put you in jail for it. What do you want to do to these guys? You don't have to speak it out loud. Do whatever you want to do in your mind with them. Say it, say it not. Do it, whatever. And she said, I sat there with a smirk on my face, as you see now, and I almost giggled because I was doing all sorts of ridiculous mean stuff to them. Sure. And I used to be a scout 
when I was that age when it happened. So of course I knew how to work a rope and a knife. So I had them hung up like cattle and I did my thing with my knife. And you can imagine what body parts I went for, peeling okay. them like an apple. Yeah. So as you can see on my face, everything is fine. I have that memory in my head now. Every time I think of that episode, I see those two hung up as a cattle, just being shredded. And it did the trick. It really, really, really did the trick. But the trick is when you go from being a victim to a survivor, yeah. the moment you know you have done that, that is the moment you're starting to help other people. Mm. The moment you start to say, hey, I had that one happen to me. How did you do that? How did you survive it? What did you do? So that moment is the moment that anybody know whatever they might have been the victim of. If you start to help others, then you know you've come out of that title as a victim and into survivor, warrior, call it what you like. Yeah. I call it the phoenix, which is why I chose my phoenix flock, because I have done this. Multiple times. Whenever I see something that I don't like in my life, I go back to the pile of ashes, sit in it, smell it, taste it, and see, okay, don't like this, don't like that, like this one. Goody. We're going. Back up. So, yeah, that might be the short version you got here. Mm. But, yeah. <laughs> That's the short version. Well, I, I'm going to yeah. take, I'm taking it back by this entire thing. I'm going to take 10 steps back for the, let the audience just let that sit there that's such a beautiful share and and most of this 99.9 .9 of this i just learned myself today and the time that i've known you and our conversations uh briefly through us connecting on wanting to have this day together your story is only growing more and more i've already had the most utmost respect for you and acknowledgement for who you are and the way you go about things and now having even gotten a sneak peek into another very key ingredient into what has been the whole entire mixing pot, the brew here that brought you forth to being this phoenix that has arisen this way. I just want to hold space for you and allow the audience also just to soak it, all of what you just shared in. I'm sure that many of those who are listening to this now and in the future, right? I mean, obviously once it's on the internet, it's there forever. So even if this is 10 years from now, just to genuinely get something out of that that they resonate with in some sort of part and parcel, some experience that links up with them. And again, this is always something that I want to do in every episode that, again, just to welcome the audience. This is your first time hopping in. You didn't find this channel by an accident. There's no coincidences in this entire universe. Whenever you are drawn towards something, it's like radio frequencies literally going on to a radio station. If you're seeking, you know, Classical music, there is a station for that. If you're looking for rap and hip hop, there is a radio station for that. If you're looking for rock and roll, there's a station for that. When you start feeling things and emoting things in the universe, you will literally be drawn towards those stations, which are those outlets in this universe. Cindy and myself offer this ability through this healing process. So if you have fallen upon this content, it's for a reason. And again, humbly, as I always say in this regard as well, it may not be forever. Healing is, is a transitory, transitionary platform. You might find my content. You'll move over to Cindy's. You'll grow from us where you need to in your healing path, and you'll continue on and find some other coach or some other influence or something else like that that resonates with your heart and soul. And if you stay here forever and grow with us, we welcome that. It's just a healing spot. Cindy is a phenomenal, phenomenal coach to be able to get you from A to Z. And she is correct that, that before this conversation, we did have a conversation about um, how basically the story that will unfold for this episode is going to be like a Quentin Tarantino movie, um, where it's at the beginning and then the middle and then maybe the end yeah. and then back to the middle and so on and so forth. So stay with us. This journey that she's walking us yeah. through is what has transformed her through her trauma into the transformation. And of course, that process is always an ever unfolding lotus flower, right, of, of endless mm -hmm. wisdom, esoteric truth and spiritual healing, right? And um, yeah. in that sense, there, to transition back over in that regard is from the transformation that you've gone through in your process, where is it that you usually find individuals on their pathway? And that, that's a broad question, but I want to leave it open to have another good 
in-depth, you know, response for you to be able to take us where you want to go. Where do you usually find them? And what's, what's kind of maybe the process? They in? find me at very, very different stages. Some yeah. of them finds me when I have, I have a story I think pinned on my Instagram that says that I'm a sexual assault survivor. I used to be a shopaholic and I used to wait a lot more. And I'm also a boy mama. Um, so that one actually resonated with a lot of women because there are more sexual assault victims out there than we know. I just yeah. talked to a woman today um, where she has gone on a hiking trip with, you know, one of these groups that you can sign up with and they will take you hiking in an area. And then one of these guys, he had reached out and said, hey, should we do something one on one? And she was like, OK, we can do that. And he ended up sexually assaulting her. He didn't rape her. But he's definitely getting closer to doing this to some woman. And we tried to kind of guide her to say, you need to go forward and say, hey, this happened to me on this trip with this guy. Because we know that this guy has multiple profiles online and he's joined several hiking groups in the California area, actually. So he's out there like a predator. And I get I see red. When I hear stuff like this, I turn into a bull yeah. and I just want to run my horns at him because I can't handle Amen. it. Um, I'm right there with you. And for me, did you know, Adam, that trauma can actually show up as the symptoms of mental illness? Absolutely. And cancers and digestive issues. Cancers. And other All, to the body. Especially yeah. your, your intestinal region is super infected by it. Absolutely. So that's what it happened to me that from the age of 16, I, when I saw a doctor, I don't know, I was 32 maybe. And she said, oh, you might be bipolar. Let's put you on lithium. And I was like, okay, that might ring a bell. Some things I see, some things I don't, but let's try it, see what happens. And I just felt numb. Yeah. I felt my emotions being numbed by this lithium. And they tried all sorts of combinations because when you are bipolar, they need to hit that magical spot where you don't go into manic or you don't go low. And I had always been bubbly and PP and stuff like that. So they thought I was hypomania at all times, that that was my normal. So they were trying to numb me down. And I just felt, fuck me, I'm going to end up a zombie in the corner here, just drooling around. And it, I turned out that when I talked to that hypnotherapist, he said, I can help you neutralize that trauma. Three sessions of 90 minutes, I will have that rape neutralized and you are not bipolar at all. This is just a trauma coming out of yeah. your body as yeah. symptoms of bipolar disease. The minute I closed the door behind me from that ther hypnotherapy thing, I turned around, called my doctor and said, I'm getting off lithium. Yeah, you can yeah. do it with me. Or you can Good. do it without me. I'm doing it. I know we have to do it slow because of my organs. But we're going to do it. So I did. I stepped down slowly. Every six months I had a talk with him. I had blood work done. I had everything done. We did it the right way. He hadn't had a single patient get off this kind of medication before. So he was super interested to see how I was reacting to all this. Yeah. And seriously, it felt like, well, I'm back to being me. Right. This is me. I've been in here all along, just hiding out, waiting to be let out again. For so the, for the I've never the felt better. I've never felt more serene. Right. I want to, I want to dive in with that mm -hmm. question right there. How did it feel? I mean that really in a loving, safe yeah. space. For the benefit of the audience, how did it feel? to understand that throughout the course of a large portion of your life, you had actually been misdiagnosed and then for it to come out that it was the opposite way. Expand upon that. That's huge, Cindy. That's absolutely monumental. I, like felt, I felt relieved. Right. I felt betrayed. I felt lost. Um, I felt like my entire world had flipped on me again. And at the same time, I felt at home. Yeah. I felt like I was being resurrected. This was me 
finding myself, finding my voice, finding that intuition that I knew I had, that I needed to trust, that I had locked away for years because people around me were telling me, you have bad judgment, you make bad decisions, you shop too much, you spend too much money, you do all these stupid things. But I was like, what you can't see, Adam, is actually that I have Don't Settle written saw, here on my arm. I did. I, I saw that there was yeah. something Thank you for explaining what that yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And of course, J Steve Jobs was the inspiration for that one. Yeah. But that is what kept me going. That's been my mantra for years. Then it turned into Say Mean Do. Because that is super important to me. You have to tell me what you mean. You have to mean what you say. And you have to do what you said you're going to do. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just messing with me. You can't. Then I can't handle it. I've handled so much crap in my day. My baby daddy didn't want the child. We'd been together for 15 months when I got pregnant. It didn't happen because I wanted to. I was on birth control. It happened anyway. I had always said, I'm not sure I want kids. Then I got pregnant. I figured, okay, it's meant to be. I only get what I'm supposed to handle. Hmm. So I am going to take this child. And I'm going to be his mama. That is meant to be the way it is. Yeah. And of course, I've never regretted it a day in my life. Of course. But his dad might have had five times over the entire course of my pregnancy where he would lay his hand on my belly and say something nice. To me or the, or the kid. And that sticks with me still to this day. I've been apart from him for 10 years, but it sticks with me to this day. That you don't even know what you're getting, but you don't want it. Or you don't want it with me. Yeah. I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. So we had two years together after my son was born. And then I told him. Either we're more than just his parents, or I'm gone. I won't live my life being your roommate. Mm. Not going to happen. Mm. I want love. I want passion. I want compassion. I want everything that a healthy relationship should have. And he couldn't give me that. He had a problem with beer. And being a carpenter, that is super easy here. That is almost two peas in a pot. Yeah. So for me to have my vegetable drawer in the kitchen filled up with green bottles instead of vegetables in it, hmm. I didn't want my son to grow up in that. Yeah. So Tice was two years old and two months when I pulled the plug on that one and I found somewhere else to go. The two weeks before we left was the best week I had ever had with my baby daddy. He was so nice. He was so considerate. He was so caring, everything. And I had so many praises. Like I was the best thing that ever happened to him. And so was his kid. And all these magical words suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Hmm. And I was like, too little, too late. I'm sorry. You have worn down whatever love I might have had for you. So the morning where I was actually supposed to get the keys to my new place, I got woken up by him sitting on top of me. I was wearing full night clothes and everything, my pajamas. And he was hitting me. He sat on top of me and he was hitting me 15 times or something in the head. And I remember screaming for my life at him. I had never at that time, I didn't know about the rape. You have to remember that. I didn't know about the rape yet. So this was the most terrifying moment of my life. I didn't know if I was going to survive it. He had completely seen red. He looked like a sociopath. And I knew Tice was sleeping in the other room. He couldn't see anything. He was in the other end of the house. But he heard his mom scream for her life at 6 a.m. in the morning. I got out of bed. I ran from him. And... It was winter. It was snowy. I didn't have any socks on. I ran out into the driveway with my Canadian goose jacket and my pajama pants and my bare feet with my phone in my hand trying to call my dad. And I got connected to my dad. And the baby daddy was smashed the phone out of my hand. 
and just keep running at me. He threw me into, you know, these stones that are lying next to the driveway, kind of like a little wall. Mm -hmm. He threw me into those several times. He threw me into a bookcase in the living room. Finally, I went in to pick up Ties, hoping that me having him in my arm was going to stop him from coming at me. And he did. I'm so sorry. I know I used my kid as my human shield, but I also had to make sure that my kid was safe. I needed to feel him close to me, knowing his heart beating, knowing that he was there. And he stopped and he stood at the other end of the room. And I said, this is not good. This is not cool. And I was sitting in a chair with Tyson in my lap, just hugging him, just crushing him into my bones. And the baby daddy just looked at me and said, I didn't hit you. I didn't put a fist to your face. It was just a slap, flat hand. It doesn't make a mark. And I just saw the transformation happen in his eye. The sociopath fire in his eyes. And that's when I was really scared. I had no idea what I had stepped into. I had never seen him like this at all. So I finally called my dad up and I said, you need to come. You need to come fetch me. I had my parents. I had my sister. I had a few friends show up at eight o'clock in the morning with their cars. And we just stood there with Ikea bags, kind of emptying all the shelves for all my things, all Tyson's things, dropping him in the car. I had to call my new landlord and say, hey, can I get the keys before? I need to leave now. Yes, of course, you can come fetch it. And then my girlfriend took me to the doctors and we had pictures taken. We did all the paperwork in case I wanted to press charges. And I had a very intense conversation with my dad that afternoon. He's, he was the one taking the pictures of all the damages that he had done to my body, all the bruising, all everything. And I had, I actually had, you know, like a vein that had popped in my eye. I was bloody in my eye and I looked like shit. And my dad had a very heart to heart conversation with me and he said, honey, do you want to press charges or not? And I said, I know I should do it, but this is my kid's father. What will I gain from my kid's father getting convicted as domestic violence perpetrator? What would that get me? My kid loves his dad. He needs to have a relationship with his dad. I can't take that away from him. I'm going to have to find a way to live with this and how to work around it. But I cannot put ties through that. And of course, that made ripples in my family. And it divided the waters. Some were agreeing with me, some were not. I have stood by my decision till this day. I haven't done it. I have never threatened him to do it. I can do it any day I want. I talked to the police already about it. And he said, there's no, nothing is going to get too old for this case. You can come in 20 years. You have all the evidence. So for me, the security is, I know I have the law on my side in this. I know I can pull the rock out from under him any day. But Mm. why would I? That would make me just the same as he did. I need to be better than him. I need to move above it. So, again, another trauma. I needed to reinvent myself. I needed to be a single mom trying to create a home for my kid. And trying to figure out what a relationship was all about for me. What did that mean? I didn't recognize good, healthy love when I found it. I tried to push it away as hard as I could. I did everything in my power to make him go away because why would he want me? The one I had a kid with didn't want me. Why on earth would this guy want me? I couldn't figure it out. So it took years of hard work, counseling, and a lot of talks, a lot of steps taken together and separately, and almost a divorce along the way. And I'm still learning how to love myself. Every day, I'm getting better and better at it. I'm feeling super much at peace compared to if you had met me two years ago. But I have so many of these ridiculous episodes in my life that shouldn't have happened. 
but I couldn't control it. It was out of my hands. Something must have, the universe must have known that I could handle it. Because why else throw it at me? So, someday Ties might be old enough to hear the story. I don't know. Right now he's not. He's 12. He adores his dad. Maybe I can tell him in 10 years, 20 years. When he asks something. I don't know. I have been preparing for that conversation for years. But I have no idea how I'll handle it. When he's going to ask me that question. (laughs) But. So yeah. Another little nugget. Another little nugget. Absolutely amazing. I just, and just the ability I think, to... that, I think that's actually the first time I've ever been so explicit in that, in telling that one. Uh, mm-hmm. My heart and my mind and my emotions have gone on a roller coaster for the past bunch of moments. I'm sure that everyone else who's listening I am so sorry. Really in. Um, it's clear on the video here to be able to see my face go through the uh, roller coaster of emotions as you're sharing with all these things. And just Really quick, hard pause for the episode of Rough Sketch Final Draft for anyone that's ever going to listen now and in the future. Um, we have a genuine, as a community, we have a strict, definite, absolute report these things, right? Like there is absolutely, we support the idea about if something has happened, you make note of it. You do yeah. not continue going forward and be quiet about it. I'm an advocate for people who have gone through these things. I've been through sexual traumas. I was raped when I was four by an uncle. Like, I mean, these are terrifying things. I'm so sorry, Adam. It just, safe space. We're all in this healing spot together. Like, if something happens, I'm an advocate for those who, who do go through things. I mean, people that suffer really need to genuinely have a moment to actually be heard. Suffering in silence. So if you're a listener now and in the future, Seek help. Don't yeah. be quiet. That is terrifying. Silence is terrifying. So hard pause. Lovingly safe space for everyone listening and for Cindy's incredible story that everyone is digesting right now. Speak up. Do reach something. Out. Reach out to someone who's been through something similar. Find groups on Instagram, on Facebook. Find a coach. Find a therapist that specializes. Go to your doctor. Yes. Go to a friend, go almost, I was almost going to say talk to the cashier at the supermarket, but talk to someone, tell yeah. someone, because if you have doubts, if you're supposed to report it, air your doubts, yeah. turn it over with someone, use a sounding board, find the courage to do it. If yeah. I had, if I had known about the rape back then, my, it was so traumatic to my mind that my mind just shut down within a few hours after it happened. I was drugged and then raped at a party. So I was in and out of consciousness through the entire thing we found out later. But if I had known back then, I would have gone back to my dad immediately that morning and said, take me to the police. I need to to get these guys for what they've done while I can remember them. Because 18 years later, I found out why I had been scanning every public place I had ever gone to, every store I had ever imagined the stress my mind had been under for 18 years, trying subconsciously to spot these dumbasses in the crowd. So I had never, ever relaxed anywhere. And for me to try to step down to pedestrian street downtown and not scan every face coming at me, Adam, I cannot express my relief when that day happened that I could just do my errands, just walk into those stores, do my business and go home and be at ease and not be tired and not be exhausted and not be frustrated and feeling like I was missing something in a bad way. But I wouldn't recognize them today. I think I've seen one of them since, but I couldn't identify him enough And nothing would happen if I did. I can't go to the police 20 years later and say, hey, that guy, he did something to me when I was 16. It's going to be a her, she case and it can't happen. I don't have evidence of it. So that case is closed in my book. Now I just have to turn it 
into something other people can use. So if you feel if you're sitting out there and you're not sure, feel free to reach out to me and I will have a chat with you Absolutely. and see if yep. I can convince you to report it or at least talk to someone about it. It doesn't have to be your immediate family because it can be super terrifying and it can be you can feel afraid that they're going to judge you. Are they going to point fingers at you and say it was probably your fault? You were probably too drunk. You were probably wearing a too short skirt. You were probably in the wrong place at the wrong time. Blah, blah, blah. Don't ever let any of those get into your head. Because yeah. being a victim of anything is never, ever the victim's fault. Ever. I will not have it. You better come calling me and I will come hit someone over the head because I will not have that. Um, I can't do that. I, I, I don't stand for that kind of unfairness. No, nope. I don't think that anyone that is healthy minded would. And I'm, I'm on board with everything that you were sharing. You know, just to express it in the truest sense is as a message for this episode. This is a deep one. I think for anyone listening, this is one of the deepest ones that we've ever actually really done so far. So I can't thank you enough also for having the openness and the genuine courage to share it in the first place. I had no idea what today's conversation was going to lead. Thank you so much for giving me the courage, Adam, for creating this space for me, for Absolutely. making me feel free to speak everything that was on my mind and in my heart. You were always safe. It was liberating. I think that a lot of people are going to resonate with your wonderful story, your story of heroic heroism to be able to be your own hero in your own life, to have found yourself in shattered ashes and to light your own fire and burn away the pain from the past and emerge as this beautiful phoenix and to be an advocate for others. It's a humongous transformation story. And it's a huge example in a loving light way to everyone that's ever going to hear this message and your story of transformation to understand that having gone through the trauma and not being open about it just to bring it right to where we are in the conversation right now focal all of it funnel it in will only compound the issue again and again right we need to make sure that we're, we're addressing it at the root cause so to the audience there's never a benefit from hiding from it this wonderful story from Cindy is absolutely vulnerable and transparent and amazing. And that's the reason why this rough sketch of final draft even exists. We're being vulnerable. There is truth and there is healing that takes place when we peel back the layers and allow our true selves and our skin to be shown to the sunlight. It allows us to heal from within. Vulnerability is a strength. It takes courage. What she has just done, what Cindy has just done is absolutely the definition of bravery and courage. So I invite you all to follow in the footsteps and make sure that you're taking the right steps. Cindy, please go ahead. Thank you. This was, this was a good. I sense that I'm tired. Oh. I sense that I am, I'm spent in a good way. Um, yeah. I know that I'm going to be going over this conversation for the next week or so in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that it was a major step for my healing process Amen. to be able to speak my entire story. Mm. Um, so thank you so much, Adam. Absolutely. Absolutely honored. And I'm sure that everyone, leave a like and a comment down below to commemorate this amazing woman's courage and um, reach out to her. She'll be open to it. Send her a nice message. Yeah. Connect with her in some way. Um, just in the in the wrapping up. And I'd be happy to share any kind of trick or book or whatever I might have in my Absolutely. bag of tools. Yeah. Well, we're coming up to about the uh, the tail end of our hour here together, and I like to always give it back to my esteemed guests for them to be able to take us wherever you want to go, even if it's another hour long conversation. Um, I believe that your soul has gotten to a spot where it's it's exhale. Yeah. And there's a relief of what you just got done sharing. Take us where you want to go. Share with the audience what you would like to before we wrap it up. And then we'll kind of go over where people can find you again and remind people about their social. Sometimes 
at the beginning of the episode, by the end of the episode, it's kind of like, oh, that's, I got to rewind it all the way back. So we'll say it again. But uh, <laughs> add anything else you'd like to yeah. before we wrap this up. Um, life is not a straight line. It throws us for loops. It makes knots along the way. Some knots are meant to be unraveled again and looked at once more. We might need to do some cleaning along the way, or we might need to even toss some people out the window along the way. But we are never alone. There is always going to be someone out there who's been through something similar to what we went through. It might not be the exact same experience, but there will be someone out there who wants to listen, who wants to hear you, or maybe just be there with you. Just sit with you. Yeah. Find them. Reach out. And if you can't find them, come find me. There you go. Sometimes the best wisdom. Nothing to add, just wrapping up with a nice bow. To be able to just sit with somebody right where they are. No judgment. Just side by side. Letting them know that they're being heard and seen. So that concludes our episode for today. Audience, you beautiful people out there, thank you so much for all the love. Like and subscribe. I have to keep reminding myself to say that. All of you in my DMs are reminding me as well. So thank you. Go find Cindy. Her links will be down below. Stay tuned for more to come from her. I'm sure more books down the road. So if you're finding this five years down the road, you know, go buy all of her books. Um, hopefully she'll grace us with her presence again as a guest also. Comment down below if you'd like to see her again. Um, she's amazing. Um, this is a friendship that's definitely going to continue uh, growing here. And other than that, thank you very much for everyone joining the Patreon. That's a new thing. That was a request. Um, so I want to give some shout outs there. Thank you to Tony, Lisa, uh, Rebecca, Linda, Lisa, Layla for being some of the original Patreons so far. And then we also have merch and that'll be down below as well. So please support the channel however you feel um, that you would like to and uh, find us on Spotify and Gotta Apple keep this space going. I'm doing the best I can. So there we go. Thank you again, Cindy. And everybody, have a great day. Cheers.